Well, I'd want, like to once again welcome all of our attendees to our joining hand session on anatomy of a Myusa exchange program. And the idea behind the session is, you know, our, our NCD team spends a lot of time talking to international exchange professionals about disability inclusion in the whole world of international education and international exchange. And we so rarely get to hear from um, some of the professionals in our very own internal organization, Mayusa, where we actually um, have several opportunities to run international exchange programs um, designed to promote the leadership of people with disabilities. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what makes Mayusa exchange programs um, a little bit different and unique, and how can we, um, what have we learned over the years about uh, designing exchange programs for people with disabilities? Um, by and for people with disabilities, I should say. And then um, what lessons can be applied from those types of programs to the broader world of international exchange and international education. So um, I'd like to start by with some introductions of my Mayusa colleagues. And um, Monica, can I ask you to please share our next slide? And I'd also like to invite um, my colleague Lydia to share her video. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, Lydia. <laughs> um, may I ask you to introduce yourself? Um, tell us a little bit about the programs that you've worked on. And can you share uh, a little bit about some of the photos, the beautiful photos that you have up right now? Absolutely. Thank you, Ashley. And good evening, good afternoon, good morning um, to all of you attending wherever you may be in this world. Um, I'm joining you from Eugene, Oregon. So morning time for me. Um, my name is Lydia Shula. I am a senior manager here at MyUSA. Um, I joined Mobility International USA back in about 2002, 2003, and um, first joined my first program was actually um, coordinating logistics for an exchange program of professionals with and without disabilities from Japan. Um, since then, I and then I through through the years I've had the joy of um, working with delegations um, from around the world, both inbound, um, but also outbound and co-led several of our exchange programs with youth, um, young adults, um, young professionals um, with and without disabilities. Um, some of those programs took us to Bahrain, took us to Spain, took us to Costa Rica. So joining us on the screen here um, are just a couple of the photos um, so on the left-hand side, um, there's a group photo um, taken in a plaza in Madrid, Spain. There's about nine individuals in the photo and they're all kind of situated on a fountain or monument that is there and they're in the front row. Um, they're sitting in rows or standing in rows. In the front row is one of the delegates who's a wheelchair user. She's got a big smile. She's doing the thumbs up. She's very excited. And then behind her, about four individuals sitting down with various disabilities. One person is blind and uses a white cane. Behind them is three more individuals smiling and in the, the top one person standing. All of these delegates are from New York City in, in the United States. First time travelers, all with various disabilities. Um, and over to, and then the next slide in the middle is a large group um, in Jordan. And it was a Young Women with Disabilities Professionals Program um, and all with US um, delegates. And we're all in a boardroom with um, Prince Saeed bin Saeed of uh, Jordan. He was the, at, at that time um, leading the um, High Council for the Rights of People with Disabilities. So we're having a meeting. So everybody's in their very professional um, where we've got um, women and men from Jordan, from the US, um, again, various people with disabilities. Um, in that delegation, we had people who were deaf, blind, um, power chair users, and yep. And then in the top right-hand corner um, is a photo of three delegates that were on a youth program in Bahrain. Um, and they are in the desert in an archeological site um, and they, there's three people, one um, in, a, in a, sorry, manual wheelchair, and then two individuals sitting on, on the ground on, 
Wisconsin, and they're all wearing hard, yellow hard hats um, for protection because out in the desert, there's a lot of things that might fall. Um, and then down below is a photo of two of our delegates who were on the women's professional program to Jordan, um, one, both smiling out in the heat, um, palm trees behind them. They're, they've got their active wear on. Um, one woman is uh, sitting in a power wheelchair. And um, actually that is Andrea Levant, who um, was um, leading the impact producer of Crip Camp late, uh, most recently. And That's then right. one of her delegates just next to her, um, uh, kind of leaning on her shoulder, has a hat on and uh, has uh, shorter arms. So those are some of the delegations. Um, so sorry for the long interruption. No, I'm very excited about our, our delegates and our program. So as we should that, be, and we'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for kind of transporting us um, and kind of giving us a little taste of what a, an outbound mice exchange program looks like. And um, I love these photos that you chose. They kind of give a, a sampling of um, the many places in which my ESA alumni have. Um, been able to travel through uh, through Mayusa. Um, thanks, Lydia. Yeah. Um, may I invite my colleague Cindy on screen and have Monica advance the slide, please? Hi, Cindy. Hi. Good morning. Hi, <laughs> hello. Hey, Where are you everybody. Calling us from? I'm in Oakland, California, and um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm sure you'll notice that Ashley's going to have to calm us all down and keep us moving because we're all very excited to talk about this work that we love so much and these participants that we love so much. So um, I'm going to talk today about some of our inbound youth programs. And specifically right now, we're looking at two photos from our Flex and Yes program students. So Flex and Yes are two really important, amazing uh, Department of State programs who send hundreds, thousands of young people with uh, young people to the US for a high school year. So a whole year in a high school with host families, free, full scholarships. So um, we get the students who are part of that group every year, who, those who have disabilities. So those students arrive and spend one week with us, usually in Eugene, Oregon, um, and our job is to give them Disability 101 Boot Camp. So everything that they've learned about the US, we're giving them that one little extra bit of information about what they should expect as a student who has a disability in the US, in a high school and in their community. What are the expectations of them? Because quite often it's different from the countries that they're coming from and also what they should expect. And so we have two photos here. Um, <laughs> sorry, Antonio, our interpreter, I'm slowing down. Um, on our left, we have um, a photo of, you can see three people. You can see kind of the side of our colleague, Justin, who works for my USA. And Justin, you can see his cane, Justin's blind. And he's demonstrating to a, a young, a girl, a high school girl who is also blind. And you can see their hands are together as he's demonstrating to her some equipment, some devices that she will be able to use to make high school and studying accessible to her in the US. And there's another young woman um, standing next to the her who's listening and checking out a couple other devices. And so this is showing that one of the things that we do when these young people come to the US is we say, look, here are some options for some, some ways that you can make your, your time here, your studies accessible to you. And a lot of the times these are new, this is new information for these students. And then on the right, we have another photo. And this is a whole bunch, maybe 15 um, young people and then a couple not so young people. Um, they're in a gym. They've just finished a session working out in an inclusive fitness center and doing, having fun doing some um, all kinds of games and, and sports. And we have people here who use wheelchairs and we have, I can see people who are deaf, people who have a speech difference, people who are blind, I see people who are deaf, someone who has an arm disability, and they're standing with their arms in the power position, so showing their muscles and, and all looking 
all smiling and looking strong and happy. They've had fun. So I've chose this photo. For, Love this photo. <laughs> thank you. I chose this photo for a couple of reasons. One, because it's in the middle of this group are two gentlemen who are using wheelchairs and they are both longtime friends of Mayusa. And this is just an example of we bring in our community members who have disabilities so that these young people can meet Americans and figure out how they live their lives in the US and get some tips from them. And I also, um, I also chose this photo to to demonstrate that we spend a lot of time in the community taking advantage of the inclusive facilities and venues and parks and all the things that we have here in the US. And our, our goal here is not to show off. Our goal here is to give these students an idea of what they should look for and what they can expect when they get to their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And I, yeah, these are great examples of um, some of the features that we're going to be talking about a little bit more and some of the underlying principles that um, that serve as a foundation for these types of activities. Um, Suze, can I invite you on screen, please? And let's advance the slide. Good morning, Suze. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your role at, at Mayusa and what we're looking at on screen here. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Dunn. I go by Suze. And um, just quickly about me, I, I started with Mayusa in 2006. And my first program, I came on as an exchange program assistant uh, for our signature women's leadership program, which is called WILD. And that stands for Women's Institute on Leadership and Disability. Um, and now I've worked my way up all the way to program manager for the WILD program. And I also manage a lot of other women's leadership uh, activities uh, at MIUSA. Um, but just quickly to explain what more about WILD, um, it's a program that was started in 1997. And we run the program every two or three years where we bring a group of women with disabilities, usually from 25 different countries to Eugene for three weeks of intensive leadership training. Um, and uh, since we started the program, we've had about 250 alumni who've gone through it from 83 countries, um, but they have also gone on to train thousands of other women with disabilities locally uh, in their communities. Um, and then the pictures that I chose were the, the, the picture on the left is our, a group of wild women at a community celebration. And um, it's called the Eugene Celebration, which is a community event that we have in Eugene um, in the summer. And our wild women were performing here and they're all, uh, many are wearing their traditional clothing from their countries and they're singing and signing our sort of wild theme song, which is called Loud, Proud and Passionate. And um, it's just a really vibrant photo. We love, I love, I love this photo of everybody and the energy um, of everyone. Um, but uh, we really wanted to show and demonstrate to the community how um, proud, you know, disabled women activists are. Um, and then the photo uh, on the right is one of our wild uh, delegates uh, during a self-defense workshop. Um, she's a wheelchair rider and she's practicing her self-defense move. She's kind of hitting a, a, a foam head in the, in the nose, um, practicing and uh, we, I included this because self-defense and gender-based violence is a critical issue for women with disabilities. And, we always um, address this in our WILD program. Um, so I'll talk more uh, about the WILD program as we go throughout this webinar. Thank but, you. Yeah. That's great. Um, let's leave this slide up. And then in the meantime, can I have uh, Susan Siegel please join us on screen? Yeah. So, Hi. Good morning, Susan. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning. Well, so Susan, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and just, you know, you started Mayusa. Uh, it's our, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, an important milestone that we're celebrating right now. And then, you know, kind of thinking back to how it all started, what, um, what were some of the motivations to create these exchange programs where, um, you know, what was missing from the other exchange programs that you observed? So looking forward to hearing from you. 
Right. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. And it's so great to be on a panel with our esteemed staff. And my name is Susan Siegel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mobility International USA. And I'm also, um, I, I, I self-describe as a wheelchair rider. And, um, you know, I think when we first co-founded Mayusa, the idea was twofold. One was why aren't more people with disabilities included in every exchange program from the esteemed Fulbright to volunteer to study abroad. So really wanted to make that happen, which has done through the wonderful National Clearinghouse on Disability Exchange. And the other thing was that there really is a global family of people with disabilities around the world. And there is a real need for people with disabilities to have a chance to share strategies and come to the US and see what's possible and to learn from disabled people in other countries. And so also there was a really, I would say a political motivation, a disability rights motivation to really build a pipeline of leaders with disabilities and really feel that we are part of a global family, including our allies who perhaps will be non-disabled people. So that's how it all began with very little money. And. Uh can you tell us a little bit about this milestone that we're celebrating this year? Yes, of course. So um, this year is actually our 40th anniversary. So, you know, I've had the, the privilege and the honor to um, be with Mayusa. And now we have over 2,300 people from over 135 countries who have in some way participated in some of the exchange programs that um, we're about to talk about. That's right. And do you remember one of the earliest exchange programs that uh, that Mayusa led? Yes, yes, thank you, Ashley, for the question. I mean, what the first program we had was actually, we invited 12 people with and without disabilities to come to Oregon to volunteer. And we were sleeping in, you know, in, in the community parks and we were making all our own mm -hmm. food and lunches. I mean, it was, it was a very different world. And Perhaps one of the memories was that the people who came from around the world, both disabled and non-disabled, were quite surprised to see that the leader of this program was myself, a person with a disability, because they were probably thinking they were there to help disabled people not be part of a strong delegation mm -hmm. of disabled <laughs> activists. Yep. Oh, Cindy, can I have you turn your microphone off, please? <laughs> well, thank you so much, Susan. That's And you know, I wish we had some photos um, to show for those early programs. But for that, we would have to go to the office and take them off the walls and scan them, <laughs> um, go through our photo albums. But I really appreciate your sharing those. Actually, Susan, come back for just a moment. Um, and Monica, I'm gonna have you advance uh, the slide, please. So one of the things, you know, Susan walked us through a little bit about some of the, the driving um, motivations behind uh, founding Mayusa. And, yeah, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper and talk about some of the guiding principles uh, for disability inclusion. And some of these kind of, I think, have been around since the beginning. Um, and others, maybe we've kind of observed as the years have gone on, like these are really important. We want to, we want these principles to serve as a foundation for not just our programs, but for the broader international exchange field. Um, serving as a model for what, uh, how inclusive international exchange can be. Um, so I have a slide up here and I'm just going to read through these um, somewhat quickly. And how this is gonna work is we're gonna go through each principle and I'm gonna ask my team to share some, uh, share some facts about my use exchange programs that help illustrate um, how these principles are kind of put into play. And then at the end, we'll revisit the slide just to serve as a reminder before we close. Um, so this slide says guiding principles for disability inclusion. We have eight. One is human rights model of disability. The second is disability leadership. The third is disability as a cross-cutting issue. Four, we are calling the twin track approach. We'll explain. Number five is infiltration is the new inclusion. Six is disability is diversity. The seventh, principle is budget for inclusion. And then finally, we're going to talk about modeling access and inclusion. So we can go ahead and stop sharing this uh, screen. 
And I'll invite um, all of my Mayusa colleagues back on screen at this point. So Susan, I'm gonna ask you to just help, our, help, help us understand what these principles are, what's the context for them. Um, what do we mean when we say human rights model of disability? Right. Well, this is Susan. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I think, you know, for, for me, one of the things that make our programs different is we see that all disability issues are really framed from a human rights perspective. So we want people to understand the historical discrimination that disabled people um, who, to have faced. And I know there's one quote that says, you know, you know, the people who are oppressed cannot expect those who oppress them to liberate them. A, 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 an oppressed people must liberate themselves. And for me, that means that disabled people and allies who are non-disabled need to work together to realize that if they want change, they have to be the change makers. And the second part of the human rights model means um, to me is that in all our programs, we really want to instill this sense of disability pride, that disability is part of the human experience. And we are proud to be who we are and express that in every aspect of our exchange. So I will, with that, turn it back to you, Ashley. Thank you. And actually, during your introduction, Suze, when you were talking about WILD, I heard you say the word pride a couple of times. Can you tell us a little bit about how, um, how the WILD program aligns with this idea of, of the human rights model um, and how pride factors into that? Yeah, sure. Um, this is Suze. So at, at WILD, um, part of sort of building that confidence and having a, a rights bearing attitude um, is, is what we really are trying to achieve. And we do that by having a lot of activities, which we call empowerment activities. Uh, but um, that includes uh, adaptive recreation activities. We go whitewater rafting, we do cycling, yoga. We have um, even a challenge course, a ropes challenge course that all the women um, go through. Um, but the sort of idea behind that um, is sort of challenging the preconceived notions about what society thinks is possible for disabled women and mostly what women, disabled women think is possible for themselves. And so doing activities where they're, they're building their confidence, um, like doing the challenge course really becomes a metaphor for women. And they tell us when they, when they think back to the time that they were at the challenge course, it really helps them to overcome fears and really be bold and speak out to demand their rights. Um, so it's all part of like instilling that confidence and, and pride and, um, um, but yeah, and also building building pride, just kind of celebrating um, disabled women activists is sort of a key part of WILD, like we do with the community celebration where they're performing and um, we do that in a lot of other artistic ways too. We have. Uh, a mural, we have a photo exhibit, we have we have all these things that sort of just celebrate um, disabled women to, to be proud of who they are. And thank you. And, and what's kind of amazing about WILD especially is um, that concept of that pride and those empowerment activities. The WILD women are going back to their countries and replicating WILD and um, those empowerment activities become part of their many WILD programs. And so, you know, we're able to see that uh, that emotion continue to scale up? And um, what are some of the empowerment activities that they've done in their own country, Suze? Yeah, thanks for that question. This is Suze. Um, so uh, the empowerment activities are, um, you know, they can adapt them to their context and we women know what will work in their community. So we just um, sort of give them the sort of principles behind a, an empowerment activity and let them come up with what would work. Um, but we've even had um, just a group of women going out into the community um, where you don't, you wouldn't see a group of disabled women going out. Um, I remember in Nigeria, one of our, our wild alumni brought a group of disabled women to sort of an outdoor um, sort of dance uh, and music, live music uh, event. and she got all of her women out in the middle of the dance floor and they all just, um, it, it, it sort of was a magical moment as she described it, that, that they, they were all just like enjoying and, and sort of having a great time, but just sort of very visible women with disabilities out in the community um, was sort of something that wasn't, you know, seen in, in, in it before. So um, that's just one example, but- Yeah, they, that's a great example. Thank you. 
Um, well, I, we have other principles to talk about, but I wanted to give everyone a chance. Anything to add? Okay, great. Next, I mean, we've, we've touched on this in the introductions, but let's elaborate a little bit more on disability leadership, because this is, um, I mean, this is kind of how MAISA started. So Susan, tell us a little bit about how leadership factors in to international exchange. What, what, what is it all about? Yes, well, thank you, Ashley. Um, so this is Susan. I, I think if you really want to talk about disabled people being empowered and building the pipeline of leaders, you've got to see disabled people be the leaders. So for my use on every exchange, whether it's inbound or outbound, either the, the, the top leader has to be a person with a disability, or if there are two leaders who happen to be going on an inbound or an outbound exchange, one of them has to be a leader who self-identifies as a proud disabled leader. So with that, I think we really have to, um, you know, sort of do what we're saying we believe in is really ensure that disabled people need to be seen and be the leaders and I know during Joining Hands, you know, there's going to be sessions to really talk about how we build the pipeline so that there are more disabled leaders in not just disability focused exchanges, but in the whole international exchange world. So I'm going to turn it back to you. Right. And I, I want to hear from all of my MAISA colleagues here about disability leadership in your respective programs that you've um, managed or co led. Um, Suze, let's go back to you for a second. Um, I'm curious, what, in what ways does uh, disability leadership kind of manifest in the WILD program? Um, oh, there's a lot of uh, examples I can talk about. Um, I'm sure my other colleagues also could mention some of these, but one of the things we do um, in WILD is we have a leader of the day. Uh, so we have uh, all of the participants have to sign up and lead activities um, during, uh, for at least one day of the program. Um, and it really gives them, uh, it, it, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to see how disabled women are leading, uh, what their facilitation style is and their leadership style. Um, but we also have more than one leader of the day. So they kind of work together too. And often there'll be women with different types of disabilities, a blind woman working with a deaf woman to facilitate an activity for the group. And they learn a lot about their own style and working with another leader. Um, so um, I, I think that's just been a really good practice for, for the WILD program. Um, but another way we, we use women, our, our alumni actually, we, we use for their leadership, um, we call upon our WILD alumni to help with recruitment and selection of the next cohort of, of women uh, for the WILD program. And um, they uh, you know, help us review the applications and give us their feedback on, on selection. Um, but we've also hired them as consultants to serve as trainers. Uh, we did a regional WILD program in Asia and we had two regional trainers um, come in uh, to kind of um, I, you know, I am a non-disabled woman and um, I wouldn't lead a wild program just by myself. Um, so uh, it would either be led or co-led by a woman with a disability. So they really served in that role and knowing how the wild program is from their personal experience, um, sort of really served as great leaders for, for the regional programs. Um, I, could, I could keep going on, but maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll let some of my other colleagues yeah, those are really fantastic examples. And um, I love that you kind of brought up, um, or maybe we can talk a little bit more later about interdependence and, and cross disability too, but those concepts came up in the examples you just described. Um, Lydia, can you tell us about, you shared um, some photos from our programs in uh, Jordan and Spain and Bahrain. Um, thinking back to some of the programs that you've worked on, um, how did disability leadership factor into those? Um, and let us hear your wonderful voice. There we go, sorry. I was saying um, I mean, disability leadership is right at the core of all of our programs. And I, I don't think that has to be a disability specific um, or you know, disability specific program. Um, piece to it, I think that can be for all programs um, as it ties into diversity. Um, so, you know, Susan talked about, you know, when you started in 1981, 
you're the leader, right? And you like blew people away that, oh, it's a disabled leader. And, you know, it's, we're still trying to break those um, kind of norms even today. And so it, I think it's absolutely fundamentally important that uh, you have um, disabled leaders running these programs. So for all of our programs, um, as Suze mentioned, um, we have um, co-leaders with disabilities. And um, I also do not identify as a person with a disability. And so I think what's, what's really fun too is that you're demonstrating that working together and the role of a um, disabled leader and a role of an ally and really working together to build an environment within our, with our delegation and um, encouraging uh, that growth and pride and empowerment and having delegates have a mentor who is that co-leader um, with a disability. And um, a lot of times the co-leader, you know, my co-leader would be able to really connect with delegates and, and we kind of ha have different skills um, that we bring to the table. So, you know, like maybe I'll be the one running around in the background, um, you know, making sure everything's working so that the, the conversation that's happening or the workshop that's happening can keep focused. And, um, and co-leaders a lot of time will lead um, conversations around disability pride or, um, you know, share what it's like to be a person with a disability from different, um, you know, different towns, different experiences. Um, and that's not something that, you know, that I could bring to the, bring to that. So um, the other piece that I would just say is connecting with, of course, disability communities um, in the countries that we go to. So we always um, partner with um, typically a disabled people's organization or a disabled women's organization. A lot of times, Sue's, we're, we're calling upon the WILD alumni. Um, actually, when we went to Jordan, it was one of our WILD alum from Jordan who founded and runs an organization, I Am Human, and we partnered um, with her organization and her community um, to, to run the program and, and really draw on their connections as well. You know, our delegation was able to have a very um, engaging um, strategic meeting with the Prince about employment and about laws um, in the various countries because our partners had a relationship with the Prince and with the High Council of People with Disabilities. Um, I remember in Costa Rica, our partners, you know, had connections with the police. And so when we had our delegates out in a market and we had, you know, we had to cross a busy street, they had the police come and stop the traffic. And so we could cross the street and go to the restaurant. Um, and um, so, and connecting with different um, disability leaders that, you know, might run the Deaf Association or going to, so, um, yeah, it's fundamental. I will turn it back to you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And I'm really, it makes me think of the international um, exchange program uh, professionals who might be on this call. Um, international educators who maybe lead outbound programs um, and they have their students meet with community members, <laughs> excuse me, organizations. And so, you know, we would, I think this is totally an example of something that could, uh, it need not be a Mayusa specific activity. You know, this could be applied to um, international exchange, you know, find out if you, if you have your students meeting with um, members of the local community and during your study abroad programs or volunteer abroad programs, um, make those make those connections. Uh, granted, it is a little easier when you have a you know network of alumni at your fingertips um, like we do. But if you don't have something like that, connect with us and maybe we can um, help in that regard. And then also, I think you know something I've observed about some of these programs, and um, Cindy, you might speak to this as well as uh, this aspect of having people disabilities be the volunteers and actually, you know, making the contributions. I think there's this association with um, people with disabilities being the recipients of service or, you know, not being the ones in charge. And so flipping that script and in any way that you can, I think is gonna make a real impact both on the uh, delegates and on the host community. Cindy, one of the photos you shared, uh, 
illustrated beautifully this concept of disability leadership. And so um, not to ask you to repeat yourself, um, but is there anything more that you wanna say about the, um, that role of inviting mentors with disabilities to meet the students? Um, this is Cindy. I think the only other thing that I would say is that we have had the opportunity this year because of COVID to do a lot of virtual work with non-disabled people. So if, even if I just think of the Flex and Yes program, the kids couldn't come to the U.S. this last year. So all of the placement organizations did an amazing job with virtual programming. And we raised our hands and said, you want to tell folks about the U.S.? Boy, do we have some people mm -hmm. to talk to you who can tell you about a, something, a movement that we're really proud of here in the U.S. And so, of course, we would have people with disabilities in the U.S., but also in, in the countries from which um, the students are from to talk about just both the disability rights movement as a civil rights movement, as well as, hey, the everyday life of Americans who are people with disabilities. So that has been another way that we've called on um, community volunteers, but also just having people be involved internationally, even without leaving their homes, which is something I know that um, the international exchange community is, is um, excited about. So that's another way we've used disabled people um, as mentors and leaders for both disabled and non-disabled people. Thank you. And just one last thing in the category of disability leadership is um, thinking about interdependence and how leadership doesn't necessarily mean you have to like have a, you know, a job title of, you know, boss or, you know, leadership can take place on a smaller scale um, through just these interactions on the program. Um, does anyone have an example of interdependence and how that kind of comes up in the exchange programs? This is, this is Lydia. Um, I'll just, I guess what, what I would add is um, so on our programs, we have sometimes people with and without disabilities and all different types of disabilities. And um, one of the approaches that is that it's really up to the group to work together, to work through, um, you know, any and every experience that they have. Um, one of the ways that we are not ways, but when we have our programs, we have this like, we're all gonna, we're all gonna do it together. And if one person can't do it, then we got to figure out something else. And there's always a solution. And, and I think that's the influence on, on one another. And um, I think that is something that can transfer to any program. Um, you know, it, it's just the um, building that environment that um, people feel um, empowered, but also like building their leadership and teamwork um, skills and, and problem solving skills and understanding that if one person's left out, then that's, that's not okay. Um, and as a community, and I, it is possible. And I think it represents, you know, a work of, as this world could be. Susan, I see, did you over, do you have something to add, Susan? Go ahead, Susan. <laughs> yeah. So th thank you, Lydia. Yeah. I just wanted to give two really um, examples of that. Um, and Cindy will remember way, way back, we had a, a program of 25 people with disability in our early years and we went to China. And we were like, we are all gonna get on the Great Wall of China. And if anyone remembers or has been to China, that's a huge thing if you got people in wheelchairs and crutches and all different disabilities. And we did it. We all figured out a way to get everybody up to the top and down of the wall of China. And another example would be if we go to the Oregon coast and everybody wants to run into the Pacific Ocean and I'm a wheelchair rider, it's not the same to sit and watch everybody go into the sand. It's like everyone's gonna get to the ocean. And if we have to get all the folks in wheelchairs through the sand, and I just want to mention those two things because for all our fabulous um, people from the exchange world who are listening, sometimes I hear about, well, we have field trips and maybe people with disabilities can't go in all the field trips. And I want to challenge that. I would, I would love to have a, a group of people always brainstorming, really, isn't there a way to get every person with a disability on every field trip? So with that ounce of passion, I will uh, stop there.
Well, thanks for that, Susan. You gave us a great preview for our final principle. Um, anything, can I, should I move on to the next principle? Um, we're next gonna talk about disability as a cross-cutting issue. Um, I think we have a lot of examples of that as well, but Susan, can you first tell us what, what does that mean for those of us who, who don't know what is disability as oh a cross-cutting issue? Yeah, well, you know, thank you. And I, I, I think, you know, Cindy touched on it a little bit. I mean, for me, I would say I can't think of one topic that you would not include something with a disability lens. So if you're talking about climate change, you need to talk about how that affects people with disabilities, the environment, food security, the civil rights movement in the United States, women's rights. I mean, pretty much I, I challenge anyone to give me a topic, but any program that you're doing, there is a disability lens to that, and that has to be included. So I think it's a cross-cutting issue, no matter what you're talking about. If you, hopefully you'll have disabled people in all your programs, but with as a topic that you're talking about, there should be this disability lens. So I will stop at that and um, open it up to any other of my colleagues to say anything else. Yeah. And thinking of, you know, um, when we were, when we used to be in the office, we had have, uh, we worked with an organization that hosted international visitor leadership program participants. And, you know, it used to be we'd only um, get a chance to meet the participants who were in the US specifically to learn about disability, um, which was fantastic. But, you know, more recently, we've also been meeting um, groups of delegations who are here to learn about architecture or the healthcare system or, you know, uh, political leadership. And so it's been really innovative, I think, to uh, see those programs think, hey, we could, you know, let's have this group hear this topic from uh, a disability perspective um, and lens, as you said, Susan. Uh, Suze, what about the WILD program? Um, because that involves a lot of, uh, you know, the content for that is um, very diverse and complex. Can you tell us uh, what that looks like? Yeah, this is Suze. Um, so our, as you said, the topics at WILD are very diverse and we emphasize disability inclusion is in every program you can think of. Um, so one of the main things we do is we invite people to meet our WILD delegates um, and dialogue face-to-face -to, -face to talk about inclusion across all sectors. Um, so we dedicate three nights and days um, during the WILD program for uh, this sort of retreat where we have, uh, it's called the Gender Disability and Development Institute. And we invite um, people who are from the international development community and um, funders and um, they come to uh, this sort of camp retreat style setting and, and, and come together and they talk about ways that they you know, can build partnerships and work together to make all programs inclusive. Um, so, uh, but yeah, Susan said there's really not one program that shouldn't be including uh, women with disabilities. And we also really emphasize that with our, our delegates that um, you should, you know, you sh these are all your programs. You should do what needs to happen to make sure that you're going to the programs and making sure they're inclusive. Um, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Cindy, tell us a little bit about the the exchange programs, the exchange programs for the inbound uh, high school students. Um, I mean, those programs, like you said, it's not specifically for students with disabilities. We just happen to meet the uh, those delegates who do have disabilities. Um, but it, in fact, those programs include um, so many more students. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, you know all those exchange students, whether or not they have a disability, how, are they getting information about disability and, and how MIUS has been involved uh, with some of those activities. Right. Well, thank you, Ashley. So pre-COVID, <laughs> um, yes, so the students with disabilities come to us in Eugene, Oregon, and sometimes they're a little surprised. They're like, why am I here? This isn't, you know, I'm, this isn't a disability thing. I'm here for a year in the U.S. And we really sell it to them, and I want to sell it to everyone, actually, as an important last step of your orientation. And a uh, Besides learning about what to expect and what is ex 
expected of you as a person with a disability, we also find that when they go off to their communities, they may not meet a lot of other disabled people in their communities when they're in the US. And so we really want them to have the experience of getting that disability lens, but we also want them to have the experience of meeting other disabled people here in the US and also among their peers. So then they go off to their communities and I will tell you, I have heard it again and again, especially this year, as we've been much more involved with alumni, Flexinius alumni, meeting disabled people in the US, meeting other exchange students with disabilities in the US changes non-disabled people. So the non-disabled students that come to the US and see access, and see inclusion, meet disabled kids, see kids with Down syndrome being cheerleaders at their school and hanging out in the, in the lunchroom. This changes students. We hear this again and again. And before COVID, um, we were invited, and I want to say that this Flex and Yes student uh, program has been very proactive about supporting disabled students here at, when they come to the US. So we are invited every year to uh, go to DC and a select group of students, Flex and Yes students are invited to DC for a civic education week. And we go and we do one little piece, but to all those mostly non-disabled students about, you wanna know about civic education? You wanna know about pub, uh, political participation in the US? You wanna know about civil rights? We want to tell you about the disability rights movement in the US. And we always, of course, um, bring in community leaders who are themselves people with disabilities to talk about that. And I'm hearing again and again this year from non-disabled people how impactful it was to travel side by side with, to spend time with, to meet in their communities, people with disabilities. It changes their perspectives on inclusion, and it changes their perspective on what is possible in terms of leadership and support of people with and without disabilities. So is that what you wanna know, Ashley? It does. And I think it overlaps with the next principle that we're gonna be talking about. Um, so I don't know if we'll have more to add, but we're talking about the twin track approach. And I thought maybe we'd start with Susan just to define this for us. And um, you know where we see it in Mayusa, um, we'll ask our or my staff to weigh in. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. This is Susan. So the twin track approach is sort of what I said in the very beginning of my comment. We think that sometimes there needs to be programs, in our opinion, that are run by and for people with disabilities that have a specific um, reason to exist, like the WILD program. Let's have disabled women from around the world come together to be in the majority, to share their stories, to share our culture. I mean, there's a really great specific reason to have a, this disability focused programs. So if you imagine there's two tracks on a railroad track, one of those tracks is to have disability focused programs where there's a reason. But at the same time, you cannot have a train on a track without that other rail coming down. And that other rail is that every single exchange program, any type, no matter what it is, also has to include people with disabilities all the time. So we also want to let people know that there are these two rails, but as I said, every program always has to have that second rail where people with all types of disabilities can be included. So I'll stop there before my passion overrides <laughs> me. So Cindy, would you say that the, the program that the high school exchange students are on is kind of an example of that twin track uh, principle? Yes, so I would say the flex and yes programs have committed to a twin track approach. That's a perfect example. And again, just to be clear, the flex and yes programs are supported by the US Department of State, which has supported this for a long time, this twin track approach. Yes, let's do more outreach. Let's bring in more students with disabilities. And I'm going to put in a pitch here for more students with disabilities, but let's bring all, all Flex and Yes programs are gonna have students with disabilities, just doing the same thing everybody else does. And at the same time, twin track, 
we're going to give them an extra boost by bringing them together and talking about their civil rights and and the things that they can expect and and some opportunities that they should look for and that prepares them to go ahead and be um, all the more successful in their year in the u.s as regular old mainstream high school students are there any other um any before we move on any other examples in mesa programs that anyone wants to talk about go ahead Suze. hi this is Suze. so um I, susan already kind of mentioned you know how wild is an example of the one side of the track that focused on disability um but uh we started wild because women with disabilities kind of came together internationally and said we really need a space to come together and share our strategies and ideas um, and just empower disabled women and have that solidarity with each other. So WILD really serves that purpose, but we also promote during WILD the inclusive side of the track as a, as a major goal because, um, um, and going back to the, the GDPI that I mentioned, um, where we're really trying to build partnerships between the disability and non-disability communities. Um, so um, that sort of is a theme throughout WILD is that is, is promoting the inclusive uh, track as well. Um, Thank you for adding that. And this is Cindy, if I could just add again, going back to my uh, Flex and Yes program, which yeah. I love so much. Um, each of the Flex and Yes uh, countries has alumni in those countries, mostly non-disabled people. So again, this year we've had the opportunity to really connect with those um, alumni and um, tell them about what's going on, you know, for, with disability rights in the U.S. And a lot of the alumni association have made the decision to use their community service energy and resources to support the rights of people with disabilities, but also to look at at their own activities and figure out are our activities inclusive here in our country and so um, they've they've made some commitments and are, are really reaching out to alumni with disabilities to be part of that mainstream um, activity well thank you Cindy and you reminded me of another example just as far as outside of Mayusa um, another State Department uh, sponsored program the Mandela Washington Fellows uh, which brings leaders from all over Sub-Saharan Africa to the United States for professional development. Um, they've started doing something akin to a twin track approach where um, they've been recruiting um, so many Mandela Fellows with disabilities and, uh, and deaf Mandela Fellows. And um, they partnered with Gallaudet um, to offer kind of an orientation for the deaf fellows to um, get oriented with uh, US deaf culture and American sign language and um, you know, making sure that they're set up for success during their um, fellowships. Uh, but of course, then they go on to participate in all of the activities that all the fellows participate in, uh, including the non-disabled um, participants. So I would say that's probably, you know, we're seeing more examples of twin track um, being embraced. So let's move on to the next principle. And we have about 15 minutes left, and then I'd like to kind of open it up. Um, so Susan, Let's have you talk about infiltration is the new inclusion. What does this mean? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Okay, I'm going to be short and powerful, but I'm so passionate about this because we know what I'm saying and what my colleagues are saying is inclusion has taken too long and it really hasn't really happened as it should. So we're telling people with disabilities, do not wait for an exchange program to invite you or to have a workshop on how they're going to include disabled people. Every program that is out there is your program. So get your colleagues, go to Education USA, go to any exchange program, apply, apply, apply. These are your programs. We say, do not wait, infiltrate. And mm -hmm. at the same way, we're also asking exchange organizations to perhaps what sometimes we call reverse infiltration or infiltration is if you want to have more people with disabilities on your program, you need to infiltrate the disability spaces. You need to find where disabled women are, where disabled people are, and do some very specific proactive recruitment to make that happen. So I'm going to stop there, but obviously I am very passionate. And it seems like when people hear infiltrate, I just see people's faces, disabled people's faces really light up like, yes, 
we're not waiting any longer. It's time just to do it. And I'm excited that exchange organizations are also feeling that passion and making very intentional ways to recruit more disabled people. Thank you for that passion, Susan. I think it's, <laughs> it's contagious. And Suze was just talking about, um, you know, how the ultimate goal or one of them for the WILD program, the Women's uh, with Disabilities program is, um, you know, it's important to nurture those um, disabled women's spaces, but also for those disabled women to um, branch out into uh, other spaces as well, including, you know, like feminist organizations. And um, so Suze, you know, I, I'd like to ask you, about um you know I, I know we've had some wild alumni attend some women's conferences um can you tell us a little bit about that it, or other examples of infiltration or reverse infiltration that we see in wild yeah this is Suze. um yeah like you said we well we try to connect uh, to opportunities where we want to see more disabled women infiltrating spaces um there's Anytime there's like a, a a a very large you know global feminist you know event a women's leadership program that we we want to make sure that as many disabled women as possible um, show up and know about it or or get themselves there. Um, so Mayusa will do a bit of you know um, connecting women to opportunities like that, and then um, but just. During the WILD program, we also try to, you know, infiltrate those, the mainstream community spaces um, and make sure that our, our, our women are visible in the community. We have, like, there's the Eugene Celebration Parade where we have our women be part of the parade, like the rest of the community. Um, there was a, the city did a fashion show and we had our disabled women infiltrate the fashion show um, mm -hmm. for part of it. And so, yeah, just looking for those spaces where disabled women can show up and you know we figure out the access and how to make it inclusive and work together with um whoever's event it is you know if needed and they, you know they might need some guidance on on that but you know we just advise disabled women to just show up and you know be bold and um it's your right to be there um but as susan mentioned the reverse infiltration also wanted to say gddi's an example of the, the reverse infiltration where non-disability organizations are coming to our disabled, you know, our space mm -hmm. um, to kind of learn from us and learn how we can work together. So those are great examples. Um, Cindy, how is the how are the flexinous um, maybe recruitment activities infiltrating the, the disability community around the world? This is Cindy, that's such an interesting question. So, um, you know, Flex and Yes for many, many years have brought students with disabilities. We think there should be a lot more students with disabilities. I think the Flex and Yes programs and the organizations agree with us. Yes, there should be more. How? How do we find more students with disabilities in all of these countries who are qualified to come to the US? So, um, you know, and, and many have made some efforts, tried to do that, not successful. So what we're, um, what we are both learning from some of the successful organizations and also trying to communicate is you, you the recruiting organizations, you're gonna have to infiltrate. So you're, we are doing our best to connect you, but meanwhile, also reach out. You, you're gonna have to put a little eff, extra effort in there. You're gonna have to go out to create those channels where you can find those students with disabilities because it's not going to be simple. So we are connecting um, the, the, some recruiting organizations in those countries with disability leaders. And then the disability leaders are in turn saying, okay, here's where you can find some students and potential students. And our partners in those countries, many countries are eager to then infiltrate, tell us where they are, tell us where we can find those students, we will go to them. We will talk them into the fact that they can be or, and, and talk their parents into mm -hmm. believing that they too can be students, um, flex and yes students. So we're, we're seeing our partners eager to do that, not quite sure how, and that's where we are really happy to connect them with disability leaders in all of those countries so that they can infiltrate 
and they're doing it. <laughs> well, thank you. And we have some great examples on the Mayusa website, um, I believe, of a few articles of some of the people who work in those organizations talking about their experiences um, actually going into dis disability spaces and saying, hey, did you know that there is this opportunity of a lifetime for um, teens and young people with disabilities? I want to tell you about it. So, um, and I will try to find that on the website um, while we're talking to add it in the, the chat window. Um, just want to remind our attendees that you're welcome to start putting in your questions in the Q&A. Um, we're going to talk about a few more principles and then we'll visit some of your questions. Um, Susan, what can we, um, what do we need to say about this principle of disability is diversity? What does that mean to Mayusa? Right. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. This is Susan. Um, Ashley, I think you and Joey Lenny um, have led so many um, workshops about that. Um, first of all, that just within disability, this is whole idea of intersectionality, that people with disabilities also belong to other, quote, diverse groups, whether they're African American, LGBTQ, um, first generation. So disability is an integral part of everyone's identity and people have several identities. And also now where everybody I think is talking about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, sometimes organizations are not getting that maybe the D in DEI is disability. And I unfortunately have seen people get very passionate as they should about gender, about race, about ethnicity, but not including disability. So let's get it right. Let's have disability be part of the, all those discussions. Excellent. And Lydia, you know, I think some of the programs that you worked on have really put that principle um, you know, front and center in the recruiting strategy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, yeah, um, so diversity in terms of our selection, and I, and this really ties to, I think, Susie would agree, even the WILD program built into the application is just a statement that the goal is to have a diverse representation of um, participants on, on the program. Um, so during our recruitment phase, um, or and actually just on recruitment, um, just wanna just add that on one of our programs, um, one of the photos that I shared was of New Yorkers or people from you know living in New York. One of our programs specifically was to recruit people um, from diverse backgrounds, diverse you know race, sexual orientation, all from New York City. And it did take us going to New York City, knocking on doors, going to youth programs, universities, community colleges um, to to let people know that this program was available. And I think it's just one representation um, or example of sometimes you just, that's what you need to do. And I, I know, um, anyway, so um, even to get our diverse group, um, it took a trip to New York to, to find those incredible leaders who did not know that exchange program was even available to them. Um, one, so we do, as we do our selection, we're looking for um, leaders that have different backgrounds. Um, like I said, whether that's nationality, type of disability, we always look for, you know, a diverse group that can bring their different disability experiences um, to, um, to the delegation. And then as we're running our programs, it's giving the delegates an opportunity to lead discussions um, with their peers and with their community um, that's important to them and their identities. So, you know, we've had a creative writer who, you know, wrote, read part of the story and then held a discussion about what it was like to be a gay, black, manual wheelchair writer living in Chicago. Um, and so all of those discussions just um, are so and critical and important and um, bring such, um, yeah, it, it, I, I, I it, lost it, words, so I will turn it back to you. <laughs> it adds an entirely different dynamic to the program, I would imagine. And, um, and, you know, you also mentioned the diversity of the types of disabilities as well. And I thought that might be a good time to mention that, like, you know, we shared photos at the beginning. Um, it's really hard to capture non-apparent disabilities in photos, but um, can you say something a little bit about um, 
representation of non-apparent disabilities in mice exchange programs. And, and that could go to anybody. Um, but maybe we'll start with Lydia. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, I guess the photo that was that I shared at the very beginning, it was a group of nine individuals. Um, and I guess many of our programs, but we have um, people with uh, learning disabilities um, on our exchange program to Jordan. Um, we had a woman um, who has a, a speech disability um, and is a lawyer. Um, when we went to Bahrain, we had um, several um, youth with uh, learning disabilities. And, um, and again, that diversity um, of disability within the disability community is, is huge. A lot of times people haven't met another person who is, you know, an, a, a person who's deaf or um, somebody who um, is dyslexic and what that, what that looks like and what do accommodations look like. Um, so learning from one another and um, being advocates and allies for one another as well. So um, I will, yeah, Thank Cindy. You. This is Cindy. Lydia, that made me think of, I also want to really put in a plug for diversity in terms of people who have visible disabilities. So we really look for people who have different types of disabilities and we want to see people who have significant disabilities that you can see. I mean, it doesn't matter if you can see them or not, but just specific disabilities that might seem to be mm, not sure about that. How can, as a as a disabled person, you know, I'm a quadriplegic, how could I possibly do an exchange program? We want those folks because we can show you how to do that. Same with how can I be a deaf blind person and how, or how could we have a deaf blind person in our program? You can, we can show you. So we also want to extend that diversity to people who, who have um, dis significant disabilities that you may or may not be able to see, as well as people whose disabilities are right up there, front and center, and may appear to be a problem in terms of how you can provide accommodations. And I think that kind of edges over into our next principle, but um, that's part of the diversity that we look for. That's right. And I think for international educators listening into this, um, they might have, they might think that they've had um, a certain number of participants with disabilities and, you know, they might not realize that they've had, they've had more than they knew. Um, but, you know, depending on the type of disability, the issue might be, um, you know, how, what is the quality of the experience when they're on the program? And for somebody else with a disability, it might be, can I even get on the program <laughs> to begin with? So, you know, there's different, um, types of barriers um, that, that need to be addressed. Um, so Susan, something that, when we're talking about diversity, um, there's something about you know, disability uh, inclusion that might be a little bit different from other types of inclusion in international exchange programs. And that's why we need to talk about budgeting for inclusion. So um, can you say something a little bit about this? And then I'm gonna ask all of our program managers to, um, explain it a little bit more detail, but let's start with you, Susan. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. This is Susan. So for me, I'm just going to say bottom line, you cannot talk about disability inclusion without talking about budgeting for inclusion. Because Susan, can I just yes. say you cannot talk about inclusion without talking about budgeting for inclusion, period, in general. Okay, I'm right there with you, Cindy. So thank you for that. And so what that means is in every proposal for anyone that's listening, doesn't, you know, disability organizations, non-disability organizations, every proposal, every budget that you have needs to include, and then we're gonna just throw out some percentages, but this is not as this is just some ideas in your admin costs, one to three percent of your admin costs, because you might have someone with a disability who needs a sign who's on your staff or a consultant who needs sign language interpreting or a different desk or needs transportation, um, a wheelchair accessible van to go on a field trip, whatever. And also in your budget, you should have somewhere, some people say three to 5%, five to 7% in your program budget. 
So as we just talked about with Cindy's example, you have a quadriplegic who wants to come on the program. You also need to bring their personal assistant. You have a person with an intellectual disability who's bringing their advocate. You've got money for sign language interpreters for that van, not a special taxi, but that they have the whole bus be an accessible bus in Washington, DC. Don't put the disabled people in a separate taxi. So all those things that you need just to be inclusive, you have them. And if you don't use all that money in the budget, you can always use it for a different line item, different line items. That has to be the start. So my staff are experts in that. So I'm going to turn it over to them. And while they're um, addressing that, I think we have a budgeting for inclusion tip sheet in the chat as well. So be sure to bookmark that, revisit it uh, when you get a chance. And uh, Mayusa staff, anything to add to this idea of budgeting for inclusion? What does it look like in the programs that you've managed? Um, this is Cindy. I could, we all could certainly talk about it in the programs that we manage, but I just want to throw it out there for you all who, um, we all have really complex budgets. Um, we know we're not trying to say just toss in, you know, just do it the way we do it. Um, and I won't go into any of the details, but you know how your budget works. You know if you have an indirect rate. You know how your programs work. Um, the, what we believe is important is however you budget, that there is an explicit line for reasonable accommodations. So it's great if you figure, you know what, when we have a conference, and um, we'll put it in conference costs that we're, we're going to be hiring interpreters. That's great, but we really recommend that you make it really explicit, reasonable accommodations line for sign language interpreters, for whatever other costs. And, and the reason is that that makes it really clear that you're gonna hold those funds. You're not going to mush them together because what we all want is to not have to make a decision based on do we have enough money or don't we have enough money. We want to make sure that that money is there somewhere in your complex budget. And the other thing I would say is that our programs have, we have had most of our programs sponsored by the US Department of State. I don't know if most, a lot. US Department of State was the first funder to say, yes, absolutely, good idea. Put a line in your direct costs, put a line in your admin costs for reasonable accommodations. So those of you who have Department of State, Funding, yes, you can put in a line for reasonable accommodations. Excellent advice. Um, anything to add, Suze or Lydia, before we move on? Yeah, uh, this is Suze. I, uh, just about the percentages, I just wanted to note that our programs are disability-focused programs, so our percentage for our reasonable accommodations is quite a bit higher probably 10 to 15% of our budget goes for reasonable accommodations. Um, um, but just wanted to talk about, uh, maybe rattle off a few of the things that we specifically put in our budget. I know Susan already mentioned some, but um, we always, and we know our program, so we know if we have about 25 participants, that you know the, about this percentage, we probably need to bring a personal assistant um, whether that's a, like a personal advocate for someone with an intellectual disability to accompany them or a, um, uh, a personal assistant for someone with a physical disability who needs extra assistance. And, um, and then sometimes uh, we, we find more creative ways to provide accommodations. Um, we'll have somebody that's local here that if somebody needs some assistance just at certain times of day, we have someone that can just come in for an hour or two in the morning and, and evening to assist them um, rather than bringing uh, an extra person traveling from across the world with them if it's not necessary. Um, and then with our WILD program, we have women, um, to talk about including deaf participants, we have women from so many different countries who use different sign languages. So the accommodation for that is to provide certified deaf interpreters, um, which is um, where you have um, deaf interpreters work with a relay hearing interpreter um, who will translate it into a more um, global deaf language that could be understood more by women who, who aren't using, AS, who don't know ASL coming to the US. So um, that is, has worked pretty well. And then also providing live captions. Um, we'll hire um, um, sometimes a, a professional cart 
you know, uh, service, um, but sometimes we will use, we'll hire a very fast transcriptionist who is able to keep up and, and just type and we project the captions up on a, a projector and screen um, during the session. So there's ways you can make it work with your budget too um, um, that we've used. And then also putting in reasonable accommodations for renting equipment. We have, sometimes we will rent power wheelchairs um, uh, for women, and then we need screen reader software and computers for some of our blind participants to be able to do some of the activities in our workshops where there's some writing involved. And um, yeah, so those are just a few. Um, oh, also we, we, we try to, and this is where we work with community partners to make sure we have access to a lot of equipment that we borrow or rent and We've even gone to Goodwill and gotten equipment like walkers and canes and things that our, our delegates use. So there's um, some kind of low cost accommodations where you can you can make it work. Um, but yeah, we have um, we get a lot of our mobility equipment um, through our community partnerships. This is Cindy. That's right. We just the other day we uh, had a volunteer contacting us saying we have some uh, wheelchair related equipment if you want it. So <laughs> we're never short on. Go ahead. Cindy. And this, this is Cindy, just to um, just to say that if you have questions about whether you can cover something with uh, Department of State funds, ask the Department of State, talk to Department of State um, about the used wheelchairs. Don't assume that you can just go to somewhere and get a used wheelchair and hand it over to a disabled participant and they'll be fine. Um, that's not how it works. But on the other hand, sometimes, yes, you can find great resources in the community that can provide really excellent, appropriate equipment. But sometimes you can also buy some new equipment. Absolutely. Well, thanks for all those practical uh, tips. Susan, did you want to add? Yeah, just real briefly, I mean, Cindy keeps mentioning this Department of State. We've also had really good um, foundations that we've worked with who also get reasonable accommodations. So hopefully the, the funding world is, is acknowledging this. That's all I have to say. Great. Well, we have 10 minutes left. <clears throat> and I thought maybe we would just wrap up this discussion about our guiding principles for inclusion. And keep in mind, this is not our full comprehensive list of principles, but we had to um, make a selection. But I thought maybe just to end on this note of access and inclusion, um, Susan and and what it means to to model um, full access and, and inclusion in a community and kind of how is that, what is Maisa trying to do as far as um, being a model for that? Right. This is Susan, you know, I think films, you know, one of our, our tagline kinds of things is creating a world as it should be. And maybe, you know, that for me is, you know, what it, would it look like if we were all successful? If, you know, everyone used universal design of people with disabilities, of course, we're an integral part of programs as leaders, as participants. I think we should reach, you know, for the, the highest standard possible. And um, that, that's sort of the world that, that we're, we're, we're trying to emulate. And I think through these kinds of workshops, I think we're trying to get um, everyone to, yeah, I'll just say it, create a world as it should be and as is very possible. Thank you. And just kind of speaking on behalf of my NCDE team, um, we did a little orientation about what is NCDE yesterday during the first day of joining hands. But I kind of like to let our international exchange uh, you know, attendees in the audience here know that a lot of the um, expertise that we have in the NCDE, um, we get from our MIUSA staff here who've led these exchange programs and, you know, hey, Cindy, Lydia, Suze, Susan, we got a question from this exchange program. They want to know um, how, you know, they have a question about hosting an international visitor who has this type of disability and they need an accessible um, living situation. What did you do? You know, how did you make this work on the wild program? Or Lydia, how did how did you go about doing this aspect? And so, um, just want to acknowledge all the experience that you had from the last forty years, and uh, and us, you know, the NCD team being able to draw from a lot of that to um, be able to in turn share with the broader international exchange community. And um, so, I hope that this session has been useful in thinking about some of these principles and how they can be 
um, kind of injected into uh, volunteer abroad, international visitor programs, inbound programs, outbound programs, the whole gamut um, as, we, as we transition back to international exchange. And Cindy, go ahead. This is Cindy. Yes, I just looked at the participant list and I just want to say hello to some of our Mayusa alumni, some of our wild women and our Flex and Yes alumni and American alumni. So hello to you all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, feel free. I don't know. Can you do reactions? Feel so, free to give us a thumbs up or something. At this point, Monica, um, I'll ask my colleague Monica to go ahead and open up the chat. So we have about seven more minutes. And so um, we don't, we've received a couple of questions, but I thought if folks want to just share um, their greetings and messages, this is, this would be a That'd great be chance great. to do that. And this is Cindy. I just wanted to add one more thing. Yes, we have tons of experience. Call us, ask us, write us, call NCDE, talk to us. We have great ideas. Every single time we bring someone from the U, from any country, or we talk to anybody, we ask, what do you need? So just a reminder that you don't have to be experts. You can just start the conversation. You should start the conversation with the individual. And what do you need does not mean you're going to get every single thing that you need. But start that conversation, open it, use the D word disability, and just begin that conversation once you've accepted them about what they might need to be part of your program. So just wanted to add that because that's what we do. That's a really important point. Well, I see um, a few folks sending some messages. Um, Ekaterine said, Ekaterina says, sending my respect and love to Susan. Thank you for all of your work. Um, and then we received a couple of questions as well and feel free to add in more in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, let's see, one person said, thank you for this insightful meeting um, about the glimpse of the NCD inclusion policy. Thank you for being here. Um, one person said, I love the examples of the Flex and Yes program's twin track approach. Um, are you aware of any similar initiatives? Um, this person specifically referring to the IVLP program, which brings international visitors to the United States from around the world. Um, this person wants to know, are we aware of international visitor participants with disabilities who came on programs that are not disability specific? And um, let's see, I wish I had a, a store on our website that I could direct you to, but yes, absolutely. We've known a lot of IPLP um, participants with disabilities. A lot of them come on uh, disability focused programs, but I think we've also met some who I think came on programs related to like urban planning and transportation, for example, and um, other topics. And, uh, you know, sometimes they bring an additional disability lens and perspective to that topic, which is always very enriching. Um, you know, for other delegates with disabilities, you know, they might not necessarily add a, a disability um, lens to the topic, but it's still really important that they are participating. Um, and another person asks, is there any assistance to disabled students that are already in the university in their own country? And how can MESA exchange programs help them achieve their academic goals? And I would just say, I think that, um, you know, my use exchange programs are such a fantastic thing, um, but for the broader world of international exchange, that's where the NCDE comes in and serves as a bridge um, between these disability focused exchange programs and these exchange programs that have a whole range of experience with uh, participants with disabilities or not. And so I would say for any person with a disability, um, who has professional, personal, academic goals. Um, if international exchange is something that can help them um, get closer to those goals, please connect with the NCDE and, and we can share any advice that we have, tip sheets, put you in touch with um, other disabled people who fulfilled those goals. So um, if there's something we can do, we will make our best effort. Um, let's see, a couple of other questions. Um, we have received a question saying, do delegates um, only get placed in Oregon or are they also placed in other locations in the United States? Uh, that's a great question. Um, maybe Susan, can you talk about the role of Eugene, Oregon in my USA exchange programs? You know, what makes, <laughs> what makes Eugene, Oregon kind of a unique place? And then for those um, living all over the US, um, how can some of these principles translate? you know, to a wider um, geographic range. 
<laughs> That's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, Ashley, our office is in Eugene, and Eugene, we think, is one of the most accessible places. So when we do our inbound programs, you know, we they, people get to see, we had 100% accessible buses before the ADA, and we've got great network of home state families. So Eugene is a wonderful place, but every city in the United States is protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So all possible, uh, there's really a possibility for you holding pro incredibly inclusive and model programs anywhere. Um, we're very proud to be in Eugene and Oregon where there is so much opportunity. And also to remember everywhere around the world are people with disabilities who are living. And so really to me, you know, we always, I uh, know, um, talk about challenge by choice that people with disabilities, you know, should think of, you know, an organization should have programs anywhere in the world, because anywhere in the world are people with disabilities and anywhere in the world are possible places to have programs. So um, I will leave it at that, but we are proud to be in Eugene, but the world is the, uh, the environment for all exchange programs. Thank you, Susan. We've also received a hello message from Raluca in Romania. <laughs> so great that you're here, Raluca. Thank you. Um, well, Susan, that was such a wonderful note to end on. I think we should wrap up now. And thank you to all of the um, attendees who came this morning, um, including international educators, people with disabilities around the world, people who work for disability organizations and others. And just know that, um, you know, we invite you to stay on top of Mayusa's um, current work through our Global Impact e-newsletter, um, as well as the e-newsletter that the NCDE um, writes called the Access to Exchange e-news. And, you know, that's one of the, uh, those plus social media are the best ways to stay on top of what exchange programs we're working on. This summer is going to be really busy um, with a couple of both virtual and in-person opportunities and um, just expanding our global network of uh, disability rights activists and leaders. So, um, any final words, Susan? Um, so this is Susan, just, I have the most incredible staff of any organization, just to, just to say that and to thank all the exchange organizations and all the people with disabilities who've joined um, this session, Onward Upward. Bye everyone, thank you all. Thanks to the MAISA staff and to our interpreter and interpreters and captioner. And we'll see you in our next Joining Hands uh, session. Uh, very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.